1995, astronomers found the first exoplanet that wasn't orbiting around a pulsar. Uh, and this planet, Peg 51b, was a hot Jupiter, something that we just don't have in the solar system. This giant Jupiter-like planet that is orbiting super close to the star, just taking a couple of days to complete every orbit. And then after that, astronomers found many more of these. And you've got to wonder, like, what is being that close to the star doing to the planet? Can't be good, right? Well, it turns out it's not. Now, my guest today is Dakota Tyler. He is a graduate student at the University of Los Angeles, and he was part of a team that did some great observations of a hot Jupiter called WASP-69b. And it's exactly that. It is this hot Jupiter planet that is so close to the star that the stellar winds are causing a tail to extend out from the planet several times the width of the planet. And so you can just imagine this planet going around the star and it's leaving this tail behind. It is losing mass, a lot of mass, to space. So if you want to find out more about hot Jupiters and sort of what the future holds for them and sort of how they help us understand planetary and solar system formation, enjoy this interview with Dakota Tyler. Dakota, it's good to see you again. Yeah, it's great. Thanks for having me on. For, for those of you who don't know, Dakota was one of the members of the Weekly Space Hangout, although, you know, we sort of roped you into it and then we shut down the Weekly Space Hangout. So you only got a chance to be in a couple of shows. Yeah, uh, I tried not to take it personally, but as soon as I showed up, everything did fall apart. <laughs> oh, no. Are, are you cursed? Are we cursed? I don't, I don't know. I hope not. I hope not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But th I mean, this is great news. So you were a member of the team that did some pretty interesting research that actually made the rounds pretty widely just in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. You yeah. found a planet that's having its atmosphere shredded by its star. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's having its atmosphere baked away. <laughs> and then yeah. as it's getting baked away, the star is like sculpting it into a really long tail, uh, similar to a comet. So, so t tell me about the planetary system first. Yeah, so it's a hot Jupiter. So, you know, unlike anything that we have in our solar system, um, but we do have Jupiter, right? We have a we have a gas giant out beyond the snow line. But in this system, the Jupiter is on like a four day orbit, just under four days. So you've got this enormous planet, all gas, no surface to land on, that's just whipping around its star. It's the only planet in the system, and it's just whipping around its star every 3.8 days. Right, right, right. And so, you know, as you said, it is, it is hot, it is gaseous, and it is extreme <laughs> to be that close. So then tell me about the observation. So, so how do you observe a planet that is in this kind of environment? Yeah, so the best way to learn about any planet's atmosphere at this point is to wait for it to transit the star, right? So we're we're staring at the star, and with respect to us, the planet crosses in front of the disk. It blocks out a little bit of light. This can let us know how big the planet is, what type of period it has, but it can also let us know about the atmosphere because that atmosphere is going to absorb some of the photons along the edge of the planet and the spectrum that we ultimately end up getting will be the star spectrum minus the planet's spectrum. So this is a transit. That's all we're doing, looking at the transit. And I know you get a couple of opportunities, right? You get the opportunity when it passes in front of the star, but you also get a chance when it goes behind the star and when it appears from behind the star. So are you able to use sort of all three of those moments of the planet's interaction with the star? No, so we only had the primary transit. Um, you, you're, you're right. You can also get the, that secondary eclipse. You can usually get like some emission, but what we were looking at is this specific helium feature that absorbs. So, you know, what, for our purposes, we just needed that primary transit. Right. And what instrument did you use? Cause I mean, Webb is all the rage right now, making all these exoplanetary detections. Did you get time on Webb or something else? No, it wasn't web. So it was near, there's this instrument called near spec that's on web, but there's also a near spec that's on Keck, which is the uh, 10 meter telescope on top of the mountain in Hawaii. And that's what we use that. The so this is ground-based, like you didn't need to go to space at all. 
Yeah, yeah. So that's the cool thing about helium. Observing these planets in helium is you can observe it from the ground. A lot of times people will try to do these observations in hydrogen, like in Lyman Alpha, and you do need to be in space for that. But yeah, we can do ground-based observations when we're looking at helium. Oh, that's really interesting. And so, I mean, is there a connection between, like if you make that observation of the helium in the atmosphere of a planet, or in this case, in the in the tail of a planet we're going to get into in a second, can you then infer that there's equal amounts of hydrogen or in the region as well? Yeah, that's, that's what we do. It's a very, it's a, a little bit hand wavy, right? But we know that there's helium and we're detecting it in this particular state that it's excited to. So we have to kind of assume that a certain fraction of the helium is in that state. And then there's this larger abundance of helium. And then we assume that there's a larger abundance of hydrogen that's a uh, that's related through like a primordial abundance rate of hydrogen and helium. So yeah, we take this, this small detection that we make and then we sort of extrapolate to this larger amount of atmosphere that's being torn away. Right, right, right. Okay, so and so when you took the mighty keck and you stared at at this point, it was like WASP 69B, is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. What, what did you find? So what we saw was what we expected at first. You know, you get this little, you get a pre-transit baseline. You imagine the planets over here, not quite transiting yet. So you get an idea of what the picture looks like with no planet at all. Then we see the planet start to transit and you get that dip in brightness. Uh, here it's a dip in this uh, in photons at the length of the helium feature. And as it exits the disk, you expect the brightness to return. But what we saw was a continued absorption of helium as the planet is, is way out here. So it's almost as though um, the helium is still in front of the planet, right? And the way that you would explain this is by a long tail that's actually trailing the planet. And, and so you were able to measure, I guess you, I guess time, how long you're seeing helium for until, until the helium is signal is finally gone. Yeah. That's basically what we did. You know, you take the orbital velocity of the planet and, uh, we know how long we continued observing, just do a little multiplication there. You find out that this tail is somewhere between at least 350,000 miles long. We actually never recover the baseline though. So if you think about that, the tail could actually huh. be much longer, but the sun, our sun came up, so we couldn't get any more observations. Right. So you need, you need more time to do a better reading. Yeah, you have to, you gotta try to t time it the right way, right? Like you don't get to choose when the planet transits and you, you need to get that pre-transit baseline. So it's like, how often does, does the timing line up perfectly with Earth's night, where we can get the pre-transit baseline and then recover the entire post-transit sequence? It's like, we, we weren't able to do that, but I mean, we, we still put a lower bound on the tail, which was good because this was a And surprise. so imagine, you know, like imagine we're looking down on the system from above. Yeah. What would we be seeing? Yeah. So you'd be seeing something um, sort of remarkable. I have this figure in my in my taper, but you see the planet uh, orbiting around the star. But then you see this enormous tail that is at least seven, eight times as long as the planet that is trailing the planet, but not necessarily like retracing the past orbit. It's actually getting accelerated away by the star. So you know, this is this is what you see in comets. It's not that the comet tail trails the comet necessarily. It's that it's positioned opposite to the star, to the sun. Right. So, so it wouldn't be necessarily exactly tracing because even like the the artistic illustrations I think we saw that went along with the story, it really looked like it was curving an arc following yeah, the yeah. planet's motion and sort of that sort of runs counter to what you sort of think about with the comets where it's it's yeah. just you know when the comet is moving towards the, the star the com the tail points away when the comet is moving away from the star the comet still points in the same direction it's all about the radiation pressure from the star and so absolutely it's a little so bit is it like a blend of the two like you've got still got it that kind of angular is. momentum of the of the particles but also that pressure pushing outward yeah, that's, that's a great point. 
Um, that's a great point. So it's not as dramatic as a comet, which is much smaller and has you know a much much shorter tail. Because if you think about the part, the atmosphere leaving the planet, it would just hang around where the planet was at, but it's being accelerated by the star. So the further it, towards the end of the plant, uh, the tail, the more that you'd see that it was diverging from that actual orbit so it still would you you'd still see the curve but it wouldn't be um it definitely wouldn't stick right to that uh that trace and so if you like zoomed out even farther would you see just a big spiral around the star that's a good question so there's like you may ask yourself is the helium just like sticking around forever is it like what's what's happening and ultimately, at least for the purposes of us, uh, for the observing purposes, the helium gets too diffuse to actually detect. So, you know, is there like this larger torus that extends, you know, well beyond the orbit of the planet of helium? Or is it all getting cleared out? It's sort of hard to say, but we know that it's getting so diffuse that we aren't really able to detect it. Um, unless it's like really close to the transit time. Yeah, there was this dramatic image that came from James Webb last year where there was these two stars that were interacting on this big long cycle. And each time they came around, one was pulling a little tidal tail away from the other star. And you got this amazing spiral that perfectly matched the the binary interactions of the stars. And I wonder, I mean, you know, as you said, you know, this is from the Earth. You're only looking at the helium. Mm -hmm. Now, when you absolutely inevitably get time on James Webb, what do you think that you're going to be able to see? He says, predicting your time on James Webb. Yeah, right. Like um, maybe you could put in a good word for us. I will. Yeah, but, absolutely. But um, – you know, the, a couple, a couple of different, so that's a good point that you bring up, you know, this case with the, the binary stars, but I can, um, I can say that there's probably way more mass that's sort of being ripped off of the stars than is coming off of the planet. So I think that the, the stellar wind in our case would, um, have a much easier time of sort of clearing that debris out a little bit, uh, to the point where, I don't, I, I wouldn't, if I had to guess, if I had to bet, I wouldn't guess that you'd be able to detect um, that spiral very far beyond the, the orbit itself. And one of the reasons for that is that you actually only get these tails when you have an extremely strong stellar wind. Like we, we observe hot Jupiters all the time and a lot of them are losing mass in this way, but not all of them have tails. You really can only get the tail when you have an extreme stellar wind. And if it's that strong, you um, can imagine that it's easily sort of sweeping that uh, that helium out until, you know, it's well beyond the detectable limit. And, and that's what I wanted to sort of focus on next was that, as you said, you know, we found many of these hot Jupiters that are surprised, you know, like the first non-pulsar exoplanet that was ever found was one of these hot Jupiters, and many of them have been found since then, uh, something that's totally unlike what we have here in the solar system. And yet it's just, it's shocking and surprising that you would have a planet this close to its star. How could it survive? Um, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a great question. And that sort of gets to the demographics of planets that we see. So yeah, as you mentioned, the first stars orbiting, uh, or I'm sorry, the first planets orbiting sun-like stars were, were hot Jupiters. And we have found that you can have close planets that are Jupiter sized, and you can have really close planets that are uh, kind of Earth sized or super Earth sized. But there's, there's rarely ever really close in Neptune size or sub Neptune size planets. And, you know, that's interesting. Like, are they not being created? Are they just not being allowed to exist anymore? And that actually motivates the research that, that we do here. We, we want to investigate what processes are, are ongoing between the stars and the planets that's carving out the demographics that we see. And you can imagine this mass loss process for a hot Jupiter, which is so massive that 
even if it's losing 200,000 tons of atmosphere per second, it's never going to lose all of its atmosphere. It just has that much of a reservoir. But you think about a planet that's a little bit smaller, a little bit less massive, then you could actually deplete that atmosphere and strip the planet and be left with that rocky core. And then when astronomers on Earth in 2024 look out into the galaxy, we see the hot Jupiters that have been able to resist the mass loss. And then we see a bunch of rocky cores that perhaps were uh, sub-Neptunes or Neptune-sized planets that just had their atmospheres completely eroded away and look like super-Earths to us. And, you know, like one of the big questions is how you get a planet there in the first place. Do you do you have a sense of, like, is it a migration? Is it a formation in, in place? Is there a sort of a, a way people are starting to think about this? Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. So what, you know, curiously, we don't really know for sure how planets form. There are a couple different theories. And, you know, migration is something that's always going to be happening. There's evidence that the planets in our own solar system had quite a bit of migration early on. Um, there's evidence that Jupiter was kind of making its way towards the inner solar system and at one point ended up getting roped back out by Saturn. So, um, you know, I... I've seen theories that say that the hot Jupiters could form in situ and like form closely. Um, it's possible that there's multiple ways, but you know, the perhaps one of the, the more readily acceptable theories is that these more ga massive gas giants form further out and then migrate inwards. And this just happens because as they're orbiting, they're like encountering material in the disc, losing some angular momentum and then, migrating in so so if like back what you said with with the solar system that if jupiter wanted to go closer to the sun but then saturn pulled it back out and in fact they all migrated outward and i know like uranus and neptune switch places and they're all a lot farther from the sun than they probably started out then maybe without multiple worlds there was no way to put the brakes on those planets getting pulled closer and closer to the star and then you get that situation yeah, that's really interesting that you say that because we can start to think about what really had to happen in our solar system to keep the Earth stable long enough for life, for example, to evolve. And maybe you need a Jupiter mass planet um, that can sort of stabilize things, but then you need another gas giant that's massive beyond it to uh, rope that planet in if it starts to migrate too closely. So it's it's kind of, it's hard to say because we only have this one data point and it's, it's really hard to, um, you know, study other systems that both have Earth-like, Earth-sized super Earth planets and also Jupiter-sized planets that are further away just because of our detection biases at this point. We're kind of uh, locked into these close-in orbiting planets, but it is, it is really interesting. So what would you like to know next? About yeah, so, this, you know, about this system, like what, what further questions do you have? Absolutely. So, you know, one of the reasons, this is not the first planet that we found that had a tail like this. It, it's happened before, but why this result was so surprising was because it has been observed by multiple different groups who saw something different. Um, the first group observed and saw a tail that was maybe like two planetary radii. So, uh, pretty long, but not nearly as long as the tail that we found. Another group observed and didn't see any evidence for a tail at all. And then, of course, we saw this tail that was seven, at least seven and a half uh, planet radii. So, you know, you wouldn't really expect a variability like that for a planet on a year to year basis, like maybe over 100 million years or, or a billion years. But year to year, you wouldn't you wouldn't expect such variability. And one uh, picture that I think is now becoming more clear is that the mass loss that these uh, planets experience is also variable. It's changing. You know, the stars go through cycles. The sun has a magnetic cycle that we understand very well. We don't understand these cycles as well in other stars, but surely that cyclical activity um, wow. cycle is going to be affecting the planets themselves. Like if it's putting out more so radiation or less. Yeah. Right. So when you do get like 
time on web every single year to do follow on observations, there may be a way to tie the appearance of the tail to increase activity on the star. And that could maybe you could like track its solar minimum maximum for a completely different star. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we've 3D simulations have shown that the way that you get these tails is by strong uh, stellar wind. And so if you keep observing the same target, maybe you can start to plot, start to trace out the times when the tail is most dramatic and the times when it isn't, and then try to piece that together with a uh, activity cycle of the star which is an interesting probe because we're trying to learn. Usually we try to learn more about the planets by knowing more about the star. And um, maybe we're now getting to the point where we can start to learn more about the stars by knowing more about the planets. But I wonder, like we didn't sort of mention the star. How, do, how does it compare to the sun? Okay. So this is a K star. It's about 80% the mass and radius of the sun. So a little bit smaller, a little bit cooler, uh, a little more active. Right, because I, I was under the impression that those K stars, I mean, they're longer living than mm -hmm. a star like the sun, but they're not necessarily as feisty as the M dwarves are. But they're still, I guess, more feisty than a, you know, a larger hotter star like the sun well yeah i mean it's not ex it's not like a, a linear relationship exactly where you have the m dwarfs that are crazy the sun which is like you know mid-tier activity and then case k dwarfs always somewhere in the middle but this one in particular we do know is variable so it is a, a pretty active star and that activity um, is going to be something that is cyclical, right? Like all stars are going to have magnetic cycles. We just don't know a lot about them. It's not easy to, to get that information. In some cases, there, haven't, there aren't even instruments that can observe um, the part of the spectrum that we're interested in to measure this. But, but that's such a neat idea to be able to measure the the appearance of the tail from an exoplanet and use that as an indirect measurement of the level of activity on the star and, and track towards its, its solar cycle. I really like that. I can see why that's kind of fascinating. What other questions do you have about this system? Um, about this system, you know, I think my, my main one would be how, like, what are the bounds on the, on the mass loss? When we observed um, we, we estimated that there was about 200,000 tons uh, per second that, that's being lost. This works out to about uh, one Earth mass or so per billion years. So a lot, but not an insane amount. Did we catch that at the peak? Is that like somewhere in the middle? It's clear that some of the other observations suggest that, um, you know, the mass loss rate can drop significantly from there. And it, I'm interested, you know, what what exactly did we see? Like what period in that maximum minimum cycle did did we actually see? Right, right. And then I guess if you could extrapolate this idea and sort of think about that that Neptune desert that you mentioned, like if you could pick a system that you would love to be able to observe, what would you love to find out there in the universe that could help sort of explain some of the the missing gaps in the theories? You know, it's it's really it's rare to find those planets um, in in that space, right? It's it's rare to find a hot Neptune, and when you do, it's almost certainly undergoing mass loss. I mean, really, any planet that's a sub Neptune and has a, a gaseous envelope is going to be undergoing mass loss. But I think that the the most interesting thing is to see if you can catch one of these kind of large planets, a, a Neptune or even a Saturn-sized planet that's really close to a star that is undergoing like rapid mass loss. So this would mean that you needed to observe a planet that was fairly young, um, under 100 million years maybe, which is, you know, baby, baby talk for a star. And that's not easy to do because when stars are that young, they're incredibly active. So, you know, the signal is crazy. It's hard to kind of tease out 
what exactly is the planet. But I think that that is, is one of the areas that we're missing, like this really young system that is having that rapid mass loss where you can make the detection, um, do the math and say, okay, this planet will be completely stripped when astronomers in one billion years try to observe it. Right, right, right. Yeah, and that there's like you get a, you start to put those constraints and say, okay, young stars, small smaller planets, they just completely destroy their atmospheres within some period of, of time. Uh, it's it you know even though we have like whatever fifty five hundred ex known exoplanets, it's like not enough to make those kinds of statistical guesses yet. We need millions. To get yeah, there. yeah. You know, and the, the new generation of instruments and telescopes will be able to probe some of these unknown areas that we're uh, that we just don't have access to yet. And that's that's gonna be really exciting. That's gonna be yeah, really exciting. Yeah. I'm excited about that. Well, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, like I think we all have a soft spot in our heart for hot Jupiters because that was that first planet that we learned about. And and then there was more of them found, and they're sort of cemented in our brains as the as the kinds of planets. When we think about exoplanets, the first thing we think about are those are those hot Jupiters. And to still see there's so many mysteries with them is is great. That we we haven't learned everything yet, even though it's been whatever more than thirty years into finding them. Uh, Dakota, what are you obsessed with right now? You know, I'm obsessed with figuring out exactly how these planets are evolving that, that, that I talked about, you know, one of the, one of the biggest revelations in the last um, 30 years or so, I guess, since exoplanets have been around is that most sun-like stars have a planet in between the sizes of earth and Neptune. And they either come in slightly larger than earth or slightly smaller than Neptune, but there's few planets in between because they're being subjected to this radiation and this mass loss that, that we've been talking about. But this is the most common planet that we find. And to me, well, we, we don't have anything like that in our solar system. So that's that in and of itself is interesting because I think that maybe when you start to learn science and astronomy, you start to kind of assume that you're not special. Like we're probably not special. The sun is probably an average star. Um, you know, our system is probably pretty average. But when we start to think about what we have actually observed, it it is starting to come to light that maybe we aren't completely average. Like maybe there is something interesting going on here. Um, and for me, I'm obsessed in, in trying to figure out exactly like how systems are evolving. I think it makes sense to assume that roughly they're starting out in, in similar ways, but there must be some mechanisms that are driving the, the divergence, not just of planets, but of like system architectures. And for me, that's really interesting because I think that that starts to shed light on the question of like, well, how how likely is it for a planet to be able to become habitable or how unlikely is that for, uh, you know, a system to experience? Yeah. When you think of the variables, I mean, like at, at a rough glance, it's like, oh, a bunch of planets in a solar system. Some will be close to the stars. So you can get some water. Well, does the planet need to have a large moon to keep it stable? <laughs> Does the system need to have a Jupiter-sized object that was protecting it from asteroid strikes? But did that Jupiter also need a Saturn that was stopping it from migrating inward and colliding with all of the planets in the inner solar system? Like the yeah. variables start yeah. to mount up, and then the 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 number of star systems that maybe can host life start to decline exponentially as you add more of these these requirements. Absolutely. And we, we have no way to kind of constrain that. Maybe everything that you've just listed is all true. And you also need some gas giants beyond Saturn to stir up things in the, in the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt and kind of like hurdle some extra water, some extra volatiles to the inner solar system so that you can have more water on your surface or something like that. It is, it's, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly interesting. And you could also imagine that you, you need like a certain amount of like carbon dioxide or something on the planet to begin with. And, you know, the but carbon dioxide gets, gets released, right? Yeah. Because we know yeah. what happens. 
And we're, I mean, we're seeing what happens when a lot of that gets dumped into the atmosphere. So yeah, there's so many things. I think what's really interesting, the first thing you said was about the, the large moon. We have an incredibly large moon compared to the size of, of planet we have. And how, how impactful was that? Or how, how much did we need to have like really strong tides early on when life was forming? It's, it's, it's super interesting. These are like the most interesting questions I think that we can ask yeah. as humans. Obviously I'm an astronomer, so I'm going to say that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, and it, and really it's just, we need more planets, like five, 5,500 planets. That's a good start, but get us more planets. And, and so that's going to be a bunch more telescopes. We need to come online and find those planets for us to, to get us for the sure. data. You know, um, we have these big astrometry catalogs like Gaia, where it's it's literally like watching the positions of stars. And we've learned so much about the distances of stars and that sort of thing through that catalog. But it's becoming so robust that I think they're going to be able soon to start um, reporting planets, right? Like motions, uh, essentially seeing a face-on version of the, the, the radio velocity effect and watching that astrometry. And we could, you know, have tens of thousands or maybe like a hundred thousand planets that sort of come into existence overnight. And so, yeah, this is like really exciting, but you're right. We need way more than 5,000. 5, yeah, in, in that next big guy release, like we've got the first three are out. The fourth one is in process right now yeah, and they could overnight yeah. go, here you go, astronomers, here's a hundred thousand planets, get to work. Yeah, like have at it, have fun. <laughs> See what yeah. else you can and find. And they're seen like not straight edge on. You're seeing them like maybe face on or at various mm -hmm. angles. And so all yeah. of the planets that we can't see, now suddenly we can find them all. Yeah. 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 You get to probe a different parameter space and see like what what have we been missing that we've just been completely biased. Yeah. Well, thank you for bringing up the mandatory guy I mentioned. Uh, which uh, is a meme on my channel that uh, oh, it always comes it? up. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. I'm such a fan of Gaia. And so it just keeps yeah. coming up again and again. Like it's, it's almost like we can pull everything out of Gaia. And then yeah. shortly we're going to get, you know, everything from Vera Rubin. So uh, that'll, that'll also find many more planets and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, well, yeah. Dakota, yeah. it was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, when you do find the explanation for the Neptune desert, let me know. Okay. I mean, I think this is it. I'm pretty sure that, that this <laughs> well, is it. This mass, this photo evaporative mass loss process, I'm pretty sure can, can Well, then you it. just need that time on web to just really lock it down. Yeah, for sure. Thanks All for right, having thanks. me. All right. Thanks, man. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Dakota Tyler. Now I'm going to talk a bit about sort of my thoughts about this field. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Hey Twyla, Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiplin, Monzo, George, David Giltonen, Andrew and Gross, Jeremy Matter, and Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. First, I just want to say how much I miss doing the Weekly Space Hangout. It was so much fun. Um, and our channel is still there on YouTube. So if you want to uh, find a bunch of the older episodes, you totally can. Years and years of interviews and news stories, good stuff. It just shows how, even though we found thousands and thousands of exoplanets, it's really just a fraction of the data that we need to be able to get a much better sense of whether is the solar system normal? Are we weird? Now, we don't know because we just have a sample size of one. We just know about our own solar system. But now we know about thousands of others. And they are not like the solar system. They are different and weird. There are these mini Neptunes, these super Earth planets that are nothing like what we have here in the solar system. And yet they're out there all over the place. And so the question is, like, as we discover more about the universe, we will find out if we are common if we're unique, and this has real implications for our search for life in the universe. And so I can't wait for the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions of exoplanets that we are going to discover in the future. All right, we'll see you next time.